Hello everyone and welcome back to Let's Play Super Mario RPG. In the last part we got the sixth star of Barrel Volcano, and now it's time for this. The bus has finally been repaired. We can start operating again. Prince Mallow! We want to go to Bowser's Keep. Could you give us a lift, please? I've heard the story from King Nimbus. You'll be there in no time. Here it comes, here it comes. It's a giant Lakitu. Interesting. So how's the engine running? Oh, it's purring like a kitten. Could you take Prince Mal to the entrance of Bowser's Keep? Of course. Can't wait to get this thing running again. Come, Prince. Hop on board. Cool. All aboard! We're off. And I guess we technically have our airship in the game. Although, it doesn't really function as an airship. In fact, if you try to leave the keep when you get there, uh, it essentially just acts as a connection between Mario's house, the Vista Point, and Nimbus Land. Yeah, I haven't seen that view in a while. All right, let's check this place out. Ah, the scent of boiling lava. It's so nice to be home. Smithy's gonna pay for stealing my splendid castle from me. All right. And the early sections seem pretty familiar, don't they? We're actually kind of going through the exact same moves we did at the start of the game. But we have some enemies to start off with. Forkies and Terracotta. Terracotta have 180 HP. They have the Terra Punch ability from way back when. Immune to fire, zero coins, 35 experience points. Have a, once again, flower. Can be Yoshi cooking into a mud mushroom or, and drop a normal mushroom. Whereas the Forkies, uh, they are, they start off in Rapture, which is basically the exact same as the Joffles being asleep. The moment you attack them, they can actually attack you. Uh, 350 HP. I think they have a storm attack, which isn't too much to worry about. Uh, seven coins, 34 experience points. Has an HP max flower and can be Yoshi cookied into a royal syrup. However, there's an interesting thing about this area in that you actually have a bit of an advantage no matter what at this point, because depending on whether or not you have Bowser in your party, you get two different effects. Let's show this off. Let's guard with everyone. Bowser's scaring the monster. If Bowser's in your party, he can scare certain monsters away and have them leave the battle. Unfortunately, you don't get any experience points for this, but eh. If you don't have him in your party, those same enemies have a chance of noticing Bowser's mood from the distance and basically just wasting a turn being confused. And that is really, really good. And now it's time for two new enemies. First off, we got Goo Goombas, 132 HP. They can poison you with Thornlet. One coin, 15 experience points, has an HP max flower. Can be Yoshi Cookie into a froggy drink and can drop a max mushroom. And then there's the Star Cruster, 72 HP, weak against ice, immune to jump, 30 coins, 36 experience points, has an attack up flower, and can be Yoshi cookied into a crystalline. A lot of very familiar enemies. In fact, uh, for being the area you've been led to look forward to for most of the game, because it's the first area in the game to get thrown out, most of the enemies in here are recolors. And I find that a little bit disappointing, but it makes sense at the same time, given the fact that these would all be variations of Bowser's minions. So, it kind of balances out. Thankfully, the area itself is still fairly interesting once we get to the actual meat of the area. Alright, level 26. We're actually getting to the point where I'm gonna start stopping the cycle of level ups the way I have been for the main three, as I mentioned before. Level 28 through 30 for Mario, Peach, and Mallow are going to be quite different. And now we got two new enemies, Malakoopas, which have 95 HP, weak against thunder, three coins, 23 experience points, has an attack up flower, can be Yoshi cooking into a maple syrup or drop a honey syrup, and Tubba Troopa, 500 HP, uh, 40 EXP, 11 coins, uh, weak to thunder, has a lucky flower, uh, can be Yoshi cooking into an elixir or drop, I think, nothing. Yeah, that feels right. I don't think they drop anything. 
And you're running into those enemies a lot. Either way, now we can go behind the throne because for some reason he has a secret passageway. Though I guess this would lead to where his bedroom is, actually. Which makes me wonder, does he just have like a button that activates the throne? Though I suppose it could be like, a, I think it's the Forbidden City in China where they have basically a front throne room for like immediate meetings with people or like introductions and then further throne rooms for actual like meetings. I go around here and you actually have a coin chest as well as a second recovery mushroom despite us just getting one. I guess it's here in the case you got the last one and then fought battle since and used FP, but eh. Also, hi, Krako. Hey, Marge, did you remember use the save point? There's plenty of danger, but it's what's best to save now. You need anything? I've got some items to sell. In Bowser's Keep, Krako's actually a shop. Uh, he doesn't sell anything of worth right now. In fact, I'm gonna use him to sell some items even, because my inventory space is quite low, and there's quite a few items in this place. Also, even though I, I as I mentioned before, I'm still keeping the flower jars and such around. Uh, in case I need emergency FP recovery, that's the only real purpose. Because in my eyes, it's more efficient to win a battle with still one FP remaining and then use a flower tab to get it all back than to use two items to get back to max during battle. Either way, it's time for the main gimmick of this place. There are six doors. Do you need an explanation? Yeah. Of the six doors, two opened into action courses. You can handle a lot of action, right? Two others will lead you to battle courses. You can fight, right? The last two open into puzzle courses. No sweat for a great puzzle solver like you, right? Once you choose a course, there's no turning back. The only way to know what's behind a door is to walk through it. You must pass through four six of the six courses to reach the end. And it's just as it says. However, for this playthrough, I am only showing off the action and battle courses, even though the puzzle courses are rather interesting because they actually have some good logic puzzles and such. The thing is, at the e end of each room, a set of rooms rather, you're given a reward for that clearing that door. And at the end of both puzzle uh, areas, you get rock candies, which is good and all. But at the end of the other four are the ultimate weapon, or mostly ultimate weapons for uh, a lot of your characters. So I find that more worth going after. For the most part, what you're trying to do is just platform during the action stages, though. In fact, uh, what I'm doing here is if I fail, I'm actually going to jump cut to a successful jump. Though one thing I should note is that whenever you fail like that, you're usually sent right back to the thing you failed on. The main reason I cut out is just in case I take more time to make the jump than I should, like I hesitate and thus waste an extra cycle or something like that. Uh, this room in particular, though, the gimmick is that the platforms stop when you jump. You do want to go after almost every single item in one of these rooms, though, because there's usually a couple of, like... Like, there's usually, like, some syrups or mushrooms, but the main thing is that there's usually a Caro Caro Cola or a Red Essence in them. Also, this is the Donkey Kong room. If you rush through it, there's really no threat at all. Uh, if you take your time and there's a lot more barrels to spawn, though, it can be kind of annoying. And that's the end. And we get a Super Slap. That would be Peach's ultimate weapon if we didn't have the frying pan. Uh, I think it's, like, 18 points worse. Yeah, that's, that's, not, that's not too bad, and its damage range isn't as wide as the other one, uh, the frying pan, but still. Uh, this room in particular, what you want to do when you're actually jumping from platform to platform, wait for the next platform to be above you in terms of height to make the jump more easily. Uh, I also want to say that the fastest route for doing this area is to do the action courses and then the puzzle courses. Because I think the puzzle courses are mostly set to begin with. Because I know, like, the first one and one of them is, like, 12 multiple choice questions you need to get 8 right. Uh, there's another one that's like counting barrels and such. Okay, this room can be a bit intimidating at first. It looks like you're just rolling a ball, but you're actually rolling the ball in reverse. So for instance, when I was moving right there, I was actually holding left. And the thing is with this area, the hazard is the bob If you touch them, you don't get into a battle, no, you lose one of your chances. Because the good thing about the puzzle areas, uh, not the puzzle areas, the action areas, is that you essentially have 10 lives. Uh, when you reach zero, I believe you're just kicked out back to the doors. Oh, and hey, the inventory limit. Uh, I will sell them. I will get rid of a max mushroom. Although I should mention, in between parts, uh, what I do do, and I'll probably mention this again at the end of the part, is I actually buy fireworks uh, back at Mobile. Because the thing is about the fireworks, I think I may have mentioned back when we first got them. 
is that they slightly impact the ending depending on the amount you've bought throughout the game. Not the amount you have in your inventory, the amount you've bought. Because you can only actually have one fireworks in your inventory at a time. Uh, you have to either sell the one you got beforehand or go through the shiny stone, carbo cookie, so on and so forth trading quest to get more of them. And I, w and I bought up to five throughout the game so far just so I can get the best possible thing later on. You don't have to do that. It's entirely optional, but it, it feels nice. Uh, this room is actually potentially one of the most annoying just because of how slow it is. And admittedly, uh, in this room in particular, the isometric viewpoint can actually be kind of the most fatal. Just due to the point that unless you're holding two directions at once, it can be kind of hard to predict where you're going to land like that. Uh, I will also actually now think about be buying some pick-me-ups in between parts, but that's just in case uh, one of my characters, like Peach, happens to fall during the final area, which we're not quite there yet, if, as you can probably tell because it doesn't say finale in the title down below you, but uh, this is essentially your biggest last stock up. That's actually why I actually recommend going after the action courses because the, the items they give you are pretty good for a stock up. The bombs are probably the most useless thing they give you because uh, there are just better ways to do status ailments or damage from various elements. Also, I like this lava. This lava looks good. Not to say the lava back in the volcano didn't look good, but it didn't blend well with the rest of the game's art. This does. Ooh, Caro Caro Cola. Get rid of the bomb. And for beating this one, we get the Sonic Symbol, Mallow's ultimate weapon. It works just like the first symbols at the start of the game. Well, at the start of the game, I think roughly forest maze area. In that the timed hit is when you basically ha have the symbols impact with each other. Either way, it's time for the battle courses. These are, I think, two to three rooms of five battles each, usually with almost every enemy throughout the game. Uh, the enemy you see at the start of the battle like that is usually what you're fighting. Like the first one was five Gugumbas. This was, uh, I think, two of the big boos and Orbisons and so on and so forth. Uh, this can be kind of time consuming, but it's good for experience points. I will admit to that. Uh, now, one thing I should mention is that in between every door, you see a fade transition. That's because one thing I did after the save point in front of Krako was uh, I went through every door possible to mark down which one is which, and I'm checking my notes to make sure I got the right one. Either way, time for our next new enemy, Glum Reaper. You're actually not supposed to run into this until the next area. 180 HP, Willy Wisp, Death Sickle, which I believe can be an instant kill attack. Same with Scythe. Lightning Orb, Drain Bean, immune to jump, three coins, 35 experience points, has an attack up flower, and can be Yoshi cookied into or drop a pure water. Uh, there aren't too many new enemies along the battle courses. I want to say there's like three to four max, and even then the fourth one isn't guaranteed if you kill the third one quickly enough. But it is worth noting. Admittedly, though, this is kind of an interesting idea, just because it, it's almost like a boss rush, only it's an enemy rush. And I don't see many RPGs do this with every enemy throughout the game. Some RPGs obviously do enemy rushes with unique enemies. I'm looking at most of the post-game areas in the Mega Man Battle Network games where they have, like, exclusive enemies added to their uh, endgame boss rushes. And here we get the Star Gun, Geno's ultimate weapon. The timing for it is that when you attack with it, his arms retract, or his forearms, or rather, his hands and that area of the arm retract into his forearms. And the moment you, that happens is when you press the A button. And you know you did it right because the stars do more damage. Now, something I find kind of funny, though, uh, well, first off, actually, it's time for another new enemy. With the Sacket from Star Hill is now the Big Bertha. 350 HP, uh, weak against Thunder, 7 coins, 35 experience points, has a defense up flower, and can be Yoshi cookied into a pick-me-up. Thunder is grossly effective against them. Either way, as I was saying, something I find kind of funny uh, about enemies in this area is that in the case you run into an enemy from Barrel Volcano, like I think the Whirlikins and the Armored Ants show up at some point or another, their sprites are actually colored red slightly. That is their way of masking the fiery glow of Barrel Volcano, 
so they didn't have to put a filter on the screen. They literally just colored the enemies redder. And I actually really like that, and I find it extraordinarily funny at the same time. But yeah, they're really throwing a lot of enemies at you. I think the big boo is the weakest one you can run into across all these battles, but still, it, it, it's kind of funny. Like, I know that one had raw bombs. That's one, that, this one's five vomers. That one's, I think, a Magmus and two Pulsars? No, two Magmuses. And this one actually has a new enemy for us. The last of the mimic type monsters, Chester. This is actually the one from Monster Town, not a bit, not a box boy. 1200 HP, Flame Wall Recover, and Sandstorm, so it can fear you, I believe. Uh, uh, weak to jump, immune to fire, thunder, ice, and all status ailments, and it can summon the next new enemy, Bahamut. 500 HP, uh, has Iron Maiden, so it can fear you. Weak against ice, immune to fire, fear, and sleep. Uh, supposedly 200 coins. I'm not sure if that's actually accurate. In fact, I don't think it gives any coins or experience points. I think any experience points you get here are from the Chester. Uh, I do know that my normal source for my enemy notes in this game has the HP of the Chester and the Bahamut mixed up. Uh, which is kind of glaring. They've had a couple of mistakes, I've noticed. But thankfully, uh, the Mario Wiki is a good way to double-check my information. Yeah, 50 coins is 200 experience points, so that's mostly probably from the box boy. Yeah, but Peach Leaf's level 27, which means that now uh, her levels are going to be a diff bit different. She's not getting any more HP level ups. Uh, the next few are going to be mostly focused on magic and I think one power. By the way, we got the uh, Drill Claw there, which is Bowser's ultimate weapon. Timing for that is right before he swipes his claws. There's no floor here. Oh, that's inconvenient. Thankfully, there's no fall damage. However, I do recommend saving, because we're coming up on a boss fight that can be potentially annoying. And uh, here's what my party's looking like. I actually brought in Bowser for this next part, because Terrorize is going to come in handy. This is Smithy's castle. No trespassers allowed. It's time to fight Magikoopa. 1600 HP, Bolt, Willy Wisp, Blast, and Flame. Also, but some potential damage there. Immune to Poison, Sleep, and Mute. Not Terrorize, thankfully, which is going to make this a lot easier. Uh, strategy for this fight. We want to just outright jump with Ma Attack with Mario, rather, at the start. So we can get Terrorize off just more, much more quickly. Then we're going to boost Mario and have him jump for more or less the rest of the fight. Uh, you could theoretically boost Gino here just to get, keep his damage up with Mario at this point. But uh, for more or less the rest of the fight, he and uh, Bowser are going to be physically attacking. And uh, you don't want to get... Uh, you don't want to boost Bowser rather in this fight because he already has the attack boost from the Trooper Pin that I put on him. And obviously Mario has whatever his accessory is, so it's too good for that. Boosting Gino is the better choice at this point. Eventually in this battle, though, he'll jump like that and make an egg fall, which will actually hatch usually a random boss enemy from the game. In this case, he happened to summon Jinx. Thankfully, while I think their stats are very similar to when you first fought them, they're generally weaker to begin with. I know he can summon the King Bomb from the, uh... I even forget the guy's name from the Mines in Mulville. That fight. And if you jump on it, you can easily do over 1,000 damage, which is one of the few ways I think I've ever seen myself actually deal four digits without Geno Whirl. But either way, Magikoopa, not a very hard fight. He's blue. Dabba dee, dabba die. Magikoopa! Huh? Where am I? Bowser, hello, how have you been? I uh, made it back here somehow, but it seems like I've been brainwashed or something. I can't even remember anything. Have I done something wrong? Uh, don't worry about it. Let's just put it behind us. It's great running into a loyal Koopa Trooper like you. I'm glad. It looks like you've got some tough new troopers now, but my magic can still help you. Watch this. Ho kala koopa! This magic treasure box will never run out of coins. Just keep on hitting it. I'll be here if you need me. Come by whenever you need to rejuvenate your HP or magic. And I'm gonna just do that right now, even though after that fight, your HP and FP are recovered to begin with. And I'll get into the problem with that chest in a moment, because right now, Krakos actually made it all the way over here somehow. However, it's not the same shop it was before. 
because now he has the hero shirt, prince pants, star cape, heel shell, and royal dress, which are the best respective character specific uh, equip uh, armor pieces in the game. Yes, the lazy shell technically has more defense. Yes, the super shell is technically better. However, for the individual characters, these are their best pieces of armor. And I recommend putting them on. Because, uh, yeah, because I didn't use it during the Kulex fight. I've essentially banned the super suit because it, it's too, it's too, it's too good. It's too good. But now let's talk about that infinite chest. See ya! The infinite coin chest, yes, is infinite coins, one coin at a time. It doesn't give you big coins, so it doesn't give you ten, meaning if you want to get max money with that from zero, you're hitting that just shy of a thousand times. And, uh, yeah, no thanks. Thankfully, money by this point isn't going to have much more use. Either way, in this room, we actually got thwomps, and they're hitting the ground. However, uh, they just freeze you. They don't actually do any damage. I think if you actually touch them, they'll take some coins from you, but that's about it. And these bullet bills contain the big birthday enemies we fought earlier. This is where you're supposed to run into them for the first time if you don't take the battle courses. Either way, let's check our equipment really quick. I've changed it around, I think, by this point, or I'm about to change it up. Yeah, I haven't done it yet. I'm bringing in Peach over Bowser. In fact, I don't think we're going to use Bowser for the rest of the game at this point. Because I want to have a better healer around for the next couple of fights. And I'm bringing on the troop because I want that automatic attack boost. <laughs> ah, so you're the notorious Mario. I'm impressed you made it this far. I didn't think you could. Oh, feisty little fella, aren't you? But this is the end of the line. Now you gotta deal with me. I'm guard. Next boss fight, already, is Boomer. Boomer has, I want to say, around 2,000 HP. Blast, Blizzard, Skewer, Storm, and Shaker. He can also figure himself up to... Turn himself blue, which makes him surprisingly not three times slower like Gundam logic would make me have me believe. But just increases power. Immune to fear, poison, sleep, and mute, so Bowser just doesn't really have any uh, point here. But in terms of the strategy, you want to jump with Mario because he already has the boost. Boost up, boost up Peach so he can do more damage with their physical attacks. And then we want to do the same thing with Gino, though I don't find it too useful to boost Gino at this point because we're just going to be doing damage outright. Uh, I do believe he has an attack that's potentially instant death. I forget which one it is off the top of my head. But it's not worth really noting. Uh, usually in this fight, I kill him before he has a chance to really do anything. Ah! This is absurd! I can't be defeated by them! I won't let this happen. I won't fall in battle. <coughs> <coughs> Having an attack... <coughs> I don't need your sympathy. I am soldier. I am prepared to go. Take a dive, Chandelier Ho. Youch. See you later, kids. Boomer. Oh, poor Boomer. But not to worry. A little fall isn't gonna hurt you. Are they making fun of the Dark Knight being a good guy trope? All right, Mario. I'll lead you to the top. We must hurry to the appointed place. Yeah, that boomer guy now, I think, but also comes out of nowhere. Hang on tight, and away we go. Mind you, now that I think about it, basically every single one of Smithy's goons kind of comes out of nowhere. It's actually one of the weaknesses of the game, now that I think about it. Increasing speed! Musical cut there because I was actually looking away and uh, was stuck on that text for about a minute. It's weird to hear the Midas Falls theme here, by the way. Next stop, the top floor. Please fasten your seatbelts and... Wait, the sec- There are no seatbelts! And now it's time for another boss fight already. Remember this guy? The eye is protecting Exor. This thing's name is Exor, but it's comprised of four pieces. Exor himself is the hilt on the top. 
Then there's the left eye, the right eye, and his mouth, the Neo Squid, which is what we're going to attack first off. Exor himself has 1800 HP, immune to thunder in all status ailments, 100 experience points. The left eye has 300 HP, Diamond Saw, Bolt, Blast, Dark Star, Flamestone, and Mega Drain, so potentially very damaging. Weak to jump and fire, immune to thunder and sleep, 30 experience points. The right eye is 500 HP, Scrobell, Venom Drool, and Gunk Ball, so it can do a lot of status ailments. Weak against jump and fire, immune to thunder and sleep, 30 experience points. The Neo Squid had 800 HP, Aurora Flash, Lullaby, Solidify, Flame Wall, Water Blast, Tech, Electricity, Corna, Corona, and Carnicus, and it's just immune to sleep. However, Notice how none of them are weak to Mute. You can basically neuter all of these things' attacks by using Mute with Peach, since Exor himself never attacks. The moment you take out one eye, I believe you can damage Exor. And the thing is about Exor, is that he is the one boss in the game who is susceptible to the Quad 9 instant kill ability of Geno World. I decided not to use it because it's very easy to take him out just by plainly like, physically attacking and jumping by the time both eyes come back online, because uh, Big Mouth, uh, Neo Squid, and both of the eyes do revive after a short amount of time. But it's very easy to do 1800 damage to Exor himself by the time both eyes are back up, because uh, in order to damage him, you only need to take out one eye, not both. I more or less took out all the other pieces just so I wouldn't have any actual ex extra attacks coming my way, because uh, Scarecrow I can work around, especially when I hit Mario, because Mario's jumping in this fight anyway. But anyone else, that could have been kind of annoying. Uh, Exor, though, despite being hyped up the entire game, even being on the title screen, kind of disappointingly easy. Like, he's already down. <laughs> Getting eaten was not on my plans today. Oh, that's... environment shift. Do you know where this leads to? It looks like Exor is the contact between the two worlds. In other words... If we follow this road, we'll find Smithy. So, what's keeping us? Hang on! Hey, I only joined so I can get my castle back. I'm not gonna be dragged along on this stupid hunt. This is as far as I go. I'm going to gather my troops and rebuild my castle. And you, Mario, you're an official member of the Koopa Troop. It's your duty to help with the repairs. <laughs> Bowser, you're completely missing the point. What? I ought to rip your stuffing out. No, think about it, Bowser. The sword connects the two worlds, right? Yeah, so? Even if we defeat Exor, there will be other weapon beasts to follow him. Your castle is at the entrance point to your world. In short, they'll be back. Is that what you would want? Um, well... Um, well... Or weapon things coming into my castle. What about my... Privacy? Yikes, this isn't good at all. In fact, this stinks! But I can't just be pals with these cretins. I got an image to keep up. Um, well... I've got it. No one insults the Koopa Troop and gets away with it. I've got a bone to pick with the smithy guy. Come on, Mario. We'll teach him a lesson. I'm so sly. <laughs> it looks like we're together on this one. Let's go. And from here on, it's straightforward through the final areas. However, this is also the last area you can easily leave to get back to the world map. And I want to do this for a couple reasons. First off, if you want to buy anything, like I want to buy some royal syrups and particularly some pick-me-ups in between parts, this is your best time to do so. However, I also want to buy some things over at the uh, Frog Coin Emporium here in uh, Tadpole Pond. I want to buy Power Blasts, which I believe costs five Frog Coins per. If you can't get, I want, I think I want to get five off the top of my head. Uh, if you can't do that, uh, the easiest way to do it is just to go to one of the other mini games you can get easy Frog Coins from, like the Goomba Stomping one, and get enough to get up to five, because the party attack up like that is going to be very useful in the final areas. Also, if you want to do any easy grinding, like using the Shy Rangers for money and special experience points over at the Pipe Maze, this is your best opportunity to do so, as well as this is your best opportunity to fight Culex if you didn't already. However, I'm all set. I've done most of my shopping. I do a bit more off-screen just to make sure my inventory is looking good. 
I also sell off some of the extra red essences and Caro Caro Colas, because I have a few too many of those to be in with at this point. But with that, I'm going to need to end this off here. Thank you guys for watching, and in part 16, we're raiding Smithy's whatever kind of base he has. See you guys then.